But good morning. Good morning. Great. We want to keep our energy up here. We're going to be together for a long time. Okay. There's three important principles about a training that are absolutely essential. Number one, you're going to have fun first. We're going to have fun. We're going to engage. Part of the relationship building issue is that I have to be able to engage with you in order for you to pay attention to what I have to say. But we have to laugh. If you uh, do this job very long, you understand there are a lot of strange things that happen to you. And if you can't laugh at a building principal that's so frustrated with a five-year-old boy, true story, <laughs> that she duct tapes him to a tree during recess. True story. If you can't laugh at that, you can't do this job. It's sort of gal with humor. I understand that. But then... The school board said, felt that she was not competent to be a principal, so they demoted her to a classroom teacher position. Oh I think that's odd, okay? You gotta laugh just a little bit, okay? So we're gonna have some fun. Number two, you came for substance, and what you have in front of you is a handout that I prepared for you. I'm old school. I could do PowerPoint, and I do PowerPoint, but I don't like it because it's a, it's a tool of sales. It's not about instructional integrity. It's about the ability to recognize that we need to have engagement. And most people end up spending time figuring out, well, how is that slide going to come in? Will it come in like this? Will the words come by that self or something? I want you to focus on the substance. So I'm old school. So what you have in front of you is a handout. And if I had my preference, I wouldn't give you a handout either. Because we know there's a term called cross-modal perceptual skill acquisition, that when you hear something and you write it, you're more likely to remember it. So what I've done is made work a little bit easier for you today. I've given you a very nice handout, and I know we're not going to cover everything, but I would expect tonight that when you're at home and you have nothing to do, you'll read it, because it reads like a novel. It's that good, okay? <laughs> but you need to write some thoughts and ideas down, and what I want to make sure that we recognize is that, that the information that I'm sharing with you is based on 40-some years of experience. started as a school psychologist in 1974 before some of you were even born. Think about that. What I want to share with you is that my life experience and all the things that we talked about in my experience, they're all interrelated. It's all about kids. It's all about people and relationships. It's about mental health. It's about behavior. It's about how children learn to behave or not behave appropriately. And we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to build a parameter and a process for you to see where that is. So what you're going to see is that we're going to move through this with establishing a base of common understanding. This is going to be important, that recognizing that everything I say is the way you need to think from now on. Everybody okay with that? <laughs> Secondly, what I also think is important is that as we go through the day, I'm going to give you salient and practical things that you use, can use tomorrow. As we get to the level of intervention at the end of the day, I will say to you that I will also have specific things during the day that I'm going to share with you that you can use in your schools or your classroom to mediate children's behavior. But I want to be very frank about this, and this is very important. It is easy to develop an intervention for a child. I'm so confident there's not a child in your school or in this state that I can't develop an intervention program for. It's not that hard. It, all the data is available for us, all the process, all the techniques are there. The problem is always the people. It's always the people that are implementing. It's implementing something with fidelity. It's talking about people's different ideological views on discipline behavior. If you're compliant and obedient driven, what happens? You think that you're going to apply punishment. So we're going to have a discussion about us. And it's important because if you're going to shape behavioral competence, it's not just about the kids we're talking about, it's us. And I'm going to share some thoughts about that as we move through this whole process. So you're going to see there is a vision for this training. And I promise you that you will be different when you leave today than when you came in this morning. And that's a promise, okay? Now, the third thing that's important about a training like this is that we have a small group. This is a luxury for me. I appreciate the opportunity to work with a smaller group. Usually, it's so many people, you can never make contact. You could never shake people's hands. You could never take the time to do that. What I'm hoping will happen today is that we have some interaction. That you stop me if I say something that you don't agree with or if I say something that's counter to the way you practice, or you want to validate something, I said, feel free to do that. Or if you have a question. We all recognize that if you ask a question, we all know it's about somebody else. It has nothing to do with you, has nothing to do with your school. It's a hypothetical someplace that you heard about it. We all agree with that, okay? So we can have a very, very open discussion about what happens in our lives, because the goal here is to be different than when we came this morning, is it not? It is to validate what you already know. It is to enhance and, and make you feel good about what you know, but enhance those skills in such a way that they become automatic and you can feel confident in the things you do or share that information with the people in your school. Okay? So, 
first of all, we have to have some fun, right? We gotta, I got to tell you a story, and if anybody's seen me speak before, you know that I like stories. And there's always a purpose to the story, and it's always important that the stories have a re relationship to where we're going. And the first story I like to tell is about what I, when I was a young man, I played in a band called the Molly Maguires, and I'm actually going to send copies of our records to, to, to the Doug. Um, and, and it turns out, interesting enough, that the records are no longer available, so I have to send them a CD. We made them on 45s. Anybody remember what they look like? Okay, good deal. Well, we had a re uh, we're having a reunion actually in, in uh, November once again, uh, but our, the band, the guys I played with in the late 60s are still alive and we're still playing. We practiced once last weekend. We all came together in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and we are going to play in about a month. Well, when we played together, we were high school boys, 15, 16 years of age. Think about that. And we played all the way through our college years. And when we played well and did a good job, Young ladies used to throw their underwear at us. It was a very heady time. We did a reunion 20 years after we played, and, and women came in through their underwear, but it was the high cotton ones. And it didn't, I got to tell you, it didn't have the same impact on, on, on us at all, just so you know. So I'm not asking you to throw underwear, but I want to tell you this story. Uh, Dr. Jim Davison, the, the, the organist in the band, the uh, keyboardist, is a pediatric psychiatrist. I'm a psychologist by training, as was suggested earlier. Psychiatrists and psychologists have a tendency to gravitate towards each other because people think we can look into your eyes and say, you know, the reason you're like this is because your mother weaned you too early or something like that, okay? <laughs> the point is that we can't do that. But Dr. Davison um, is a very good friend, and he uh, has two distinct personality flaws as I can evaluate him. First of all, he's obsessive compulsive. Do you know people like this? This man is so incredibly obsessive. He ruminates about things over and over, but he's incredibly compulsive. You can go into his office, and it doesn't matter how busy he is, his desk is perfectly clear. His pictures, like those pictures, are all hung at the same level. You know how hard that is to do that? You open up his desk drawer, paper clips are stacked on top of each other. I, I, I think there's something wrong with that, personally, okay? <laughs> the other flaw that Dr. Davison has, he's never had a bad thing to say about children. Honestly, you work in schools, you have kids of your own, you have neighborhood kids, you've at least thought bad things from time to time. <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with it. It's not acting on it. It's the problem. Well, a few years ago, Dr. Davison called me up, and I was in my garage, and I had a landline, and, and I don't know why I have a phone in there, but I do. And the phone rings, and you know this to be true, that when you're focusing on your task and somebody calls you, you're kind of half listening, but you're not really paying attention to all the things. You're going, hmm, yeah, that sounds good and everything. And at the end, he says to me, well, can you come? And I hadn't heard really anything that he was talking about. And I said, I, we must have had a bad connection. Can I come where? He said, well, on Friday, I'm putting in this patio in my backyard and I want you to help me. Well, when an obsessive compulsive asks you to volunteer to help him, you want to be busy. You don't, you don't want to be available, okay? And, but I didn't have an instant excuse, and so I'm sort of, and it seemed like minutes, and I'm sure it was just seconds, but I, I couldn't come up with a reason why I couldn't go. And finally I said, oh, I'd like to, Jim. You always foreshadow why you can't with a nice positive. But, 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 and, and then the but came. I, it, I don't know where it came from, but it was there. And I said, but my favorite aunt passed away. <laughs> and he looks at me, or he, he said, really? He said, yeah, and he, he had a great memory. He said, that, that's Aunt Ida, isn't it? And I said, yeah, and, he, and I said, yeah, the family's feeling pretty bad. And he said, but wait a minute. He said, didn't she die last year? <laughs> well, yes, yes, she did. <laughs> but our family has a tradition of follow-up funerals. You know how you kind of build a lie, you can't get out of it. So here I am at 9 o'clock in the morning at his house in La Crosse, Wisconsin, by the mighty Mississippi. It was hot, humid weather, unbelievably bad. We work for four hours, the cement trucks come in, we pour the cement by about three o'clock in the afternoon. And by the way, we take no breaks, obsessive compulsive don't do that. We have a pretty decent looking patio and I'm ready to leave. And Dr. Davison looks at us and no, you know, look, look at there's ripples here in the cement and there's little pock marks. We need to do something about that. And I'm a little frustrated and feel like I've been taken advantage. And I say to him, you know, well, maybe we could have a barbecue. And then somebody would drop a hamburger or a hot dog onto the ground it would spill out the ketchup and the mustard, which would eventually fill those holes, and then the dirt and the wind would come. It would be okay. He wasn't having any of that, so we worked really literally three more hours. By late afternoon, we have a perfect-looking patio. It was almost so perfect, it was like a mirror. You could just see yourself in it. Well, 
At this point in time, I'm very tired and I grab a Mountain Dew and all of us know this to be true that when you're tired, you don't realize how tired you actually are until you stop doing something. And I go and I sit next to the shade tree and I start to drink this Mountain Dew, but I'm falling asleep. And as I'm falling asleep, I hear these little kids laughing and giggling and this dog barking. And I didn't really pay much attention to it until suddenly out of nowhere comes these three children, a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-and-a-half-year-old chasing a little wiener dog. Not the big one, the little one. There's a miniature version of the wiener dog. They chase this dog right into the fresh cement. I think this is funny. Dr. Davison does not. <laughs> The dog's legs, though, were so short and the cement was still so wet that it sunk down and literally made like a snake mark with its belly right through the cement. Well, for those of you that have children, you know that they have no idea. They're focused on catching this little dog. The two, the five and the four-year-old, they go boom, boom, boom right through the fresh cement. They have no idea what they've just done. But the little guy doesn't have the motoric skills to get up this first step that we kind of built. He trips and falls face first right into the cement, just like a... Uh, have you ever seen a beetle that can't get back on its, you know, on its legs? That's just what he was doing, making kind of like a snowman in the cement. And he starts to cry. Well, I run over to him, pick him up, and I'm taking cement out of his ears and his eyes. He's just covered with this stuff, okay? Where's Dr. Jim Davison, the pediatric psychiatrist? Never has a bad thing to say about children, meanwhile. No, he's actually chasing the five-year-old boy, <laughs> screaming and hollering at him and swearing and saying words, frankly, that I've never even heard before. If I may say so in a syntactically correct manner, he was like a crazy man. I've never seen him like this. So I take my little boy, I think this is funny later, Dr. Davison does not, but I put him and sit him right on the edge of the cement of the patio. His little cheeks made indentations on the patio. It was kind of cute. I run over to Davison and I grab him literally before I think he's going to physically confront this boy. I pull him to the side like that. The kid runs screaming off to his mom and dad, certainly to report us to social services. There's no doubt. And I grab him and I say, Jim, honestly, what is the matter with you? And he just, I mean, he's, he's got this look in his eyes. It's just unbelievable. I said, I, I, I can't believe this. Said, of all people, I said, Jim, I thought you loved children. And he stopped for me and he said, well, I love them in the abstract, but not in the concrete. <laughs> okay. All right. I know. It's a long ways to get to the point, okay? But the reason I tell you that story is this. Behavior is not abstract. It's very concrete. It is knowable. We understand more about children than we lead on. We, our actions sometimes belie the fact that children's behavior is clearly known to us. And what I'm going to do is try to change some of the dynamics and how you look at things in a systematic way to recognize this is very concrete information. There are things that we have come to love that are not true. Let me give you a couple of examples. Topography. We often look at behavior by topography. If I use very negative words and say something to you, you make me so mad I want to kill you. That makes you feel uncomfortable, isn't that right? Makes everybody very anxious. What you really should be knowing though is that at least I've decided not to, to at this point in time because I told you I was going to. If you understand behavior and recognize it's the words that are not important, it's the actions. The question you should say to yourself, why would a kid resort to using language like that to get what they need. What's missing in this picture here? Yes, we need to be sure there's no danger that's involved in this. I'm not trying to take away from that concept. But what I'm saying to you is what purpose does that serve? What purpose does that behavior serve? But we're in love with topography. If we see it, we react to it, and as a result of it, we emotionalize it and we actually escalate it. We need to change that. It's not important about topography. Second thing, the idea about punishment. We look at punishment in a very interesting way. When we talk about intervention, you're not going to hear me talk about much punishment at all today because consequences are already well known to everyone in this room. Everybody here either has a prescriptive cookbook on the consequences of have children or you're going to make one. Schools all the time create these little Bibles, so to speak, that says if Eric Harwick does this, this is what's going to happen to him over here. But discipline is about teaching. There isn't a person in this room, if a kid didn't know the alphabetic principle, you would teach him, isn't that right? But when it comes to a kid that doesn't know how to line up properly, or a kid that doesn't know how to engage in reciprocal communication, or says things that are not acceptable because they can't express themselves in any other ways, we punish them for it. Think about this for just a minute. It's about teaching. 
If you're expelled from the Chicken Little Preschool camp at the age of three, that's not a good developmental sign. It's no longer little kids' little problems. We need to recognize what skills does that child need in order to mediate their environment. And I'm going to tell you why that's a problem later on. The final thing I want to share with you that I think is important, it's about the people part of it. It's easy for us to, to engage and emotionalize inappropriate behavior. Nobody in this room wants children to be disrespectful. Nobody wants children to be unsafe. Nobody wants children to act in ways that make people feel bad. But the reality is, is that if we can teach the people to understand that those actions are the way the child manages their environment, they have learned to behave that way. That's the way they mediate their environment. They're not bad people. They've learned to be bad kids in terms of their behavior, not the person. So we have to think, if they can learn inappropriate behaviors, then we can teach them the behaviors we want them to engage in. Unfortunately, though, the way we do it is to deliver consequences. And if you don't have the skills and you get punished for something you don't know how to do, how does that help you? Do you see what I mean? And oftentimes what happens is classroom teachers, administrators, parents, look at behavior as though I can discipline that inappropriate or punish that behavior out of a kid. What I'd like to suggest to you is we need to change that dynamic. I'm not opposed to punishment, by the way. It works very well in certain sit situations. But it turns out that punishment doesn't teach a new skill. And so our job here today is to talk about what is our responsibility when it comes to behavior. It's like academics. We have to teach these skills. We have to make sure kids know what it is we want them to do. Schools are rural and intensely, rural governed and intensely driven environments that many children have not learned the skills necessary to mediate that. And I'll give you some examples of that as we move through today. So now if you would, let's turn to the index. Strap your seatbelts on because we're going to move fast. Believe me, I will say to you, if you want me to talk slower, it's not going to happen. Uh, you can ask and you can try to do something, but a better model would be is to ask me to repeat something because in order for us to engage, we need to move fast. We need to make sure that you're involved in this process. So I'm not going to talk like, by the way, here's my first point. It's not going to work that way. We're going to move fast, okay? But I want you to sit, reference that everything we talk about will be in your handout. Let's turn to page two for just a minute. Let us talk about some of the, the, the things we're going to be talking about today. First of all, part one, behavior and discipline. How do we shape emotional behavioral competence? I'm going to set the stage for you in this first hour and 15 minutes where we talk about some of those dynamics, maybe a little bit after the break. We're going to talk about a protocol, a process. We need to make sure we have a process of looking at behavior differently and I put together what I call a 10-step protocol and it really is designed to point you in the right direction. It's not every point has to be addressed in every situation, but if you address all of these points in t difficult situations, you're more likely to be successful. You have to have a process. If you have a process, steps that you follow, you're more likely to be able to intervene in a, a, a significant way. Turns out interesting enough, we talk about evidence-based practices and empirical studies. Most of you don't read any of that stuff. 90% of the articles that are written are never read by anybody. Do you know that? Except the author and the co-author. 50% of the articles that are written in journal article, uh, journals more often are repeated and used in other articles. They're not used, according to the Smithsonian. What does that mean? It means we don't read it. We don't apply it. And when we do read it, we don't understand it in the way that it needs to be done effectively. And most often than not, people believe the methodology they know the least about. That's a problem, and we're going to talk about how we deal with that. So what process is going to be important for us to get to where you need to go at the end of the day? And then finally, um, part three is going to be about building relationships and the interventions, the types of things that that might be helpful for you. And I've listed 10 of them here because they're, I call them the top 10 well-known but seldom used interventions that are very effective for instructional integrity and changing the climate. And they're based on three principles, prevention, management, and correction. And we'll talk about how that applies as we go through the day. And then finally, uh, uh, they did ask me to talk a little bit about a rating scale that I developed, a universal behavior rating scale that we'll share a little bit later with you. It's called the best. And that information is something that is important to quantify when children fall out of the range of acceptability. It's based on a Likert standardized, standardized model that might be helpful and interesting for you to use as you move forward. But that will not be the main focus of our discussion. Any questions about what we're doing today? 
Great. I see none. I didn't even give you a ch chance to respond because we need to go on. Let's turn to page five, if we will. Shaping emotional and behavioral competence. There's been a call for a change in our work and how children are taught. We now know that it's about skill development. It is about being sure that children have the skills that we want them to be involved in in order to be successful. Turns out, interestingly enough, when we start to look at children, we have seen things in a different fashion and a different way than we need to move forward. It's no longer about stopping them from engaging in inappropriate behavior. It's about teaching them appropriate replacement behavior. How we teach our children is important. And personally, behavior is, and mental health needs are far more important than academic needs. I believe that if we get kids on the right foot, behaviorally and emotionally, we're more likely to be successful academically with those children. We need to know where they came from. Think about this for just a minute. Children with discipline-related issues come sometimes from chaotic environments. Wouldn't you agree with that? Many times they come to school without the skills necessary to mediate the environment. And when they get in that environment, we punish them out of a behavior when in fact they just don't know what to do. Think about this, if you will, for just a minute. How many people here remember when they first went to junior high school or middle school? You remember those days? Were you anxious? Were you wondering what life was going to be like? And didn't you think you were alone? Didn't you think that everybody else seemed to have a handle on what was happening, but maybe you didn't? Well, now we're adults, and we can look back at that experience and realize how trite that was. But to us at that point in time, it was a new environment, new demands, new expectations. We're moving through puberty. We're going through expectations with staff members that are different. The reality simply is, think about this, for example. Children who come to school without the skill set necessary to mediate that environment, how are they going to survive? They're going to resort on behaviors that are most efficient and effective for them. And those behaviors may be unacceptable to us, but it may be what they need in order to mediate that environment. We need to recognize our job is to teach them those skills, and we'll talk more about that. Number two, how teachers are prepared. We've done a woeful, uh, inadequate job in really preparing staff members for what they're going to experience. How many people here, and I'm not saying that college is a bad situation, the university is a great way to get your, your opportunities, but what you learn there and what actually applies in school is sometimes different, is it not? And we need to re realize that it's not their fault. It's not their job to give us the life experience because they can't. Why? Because we have to practice. We have to practice what they teach us so we can use it on the kids that we're going to work with. The problem with it is, is that we practice on kids. Isn't that right? If you want to be a good athlete or a good musician, you have to practice, do you not? Well, if you want to be a good teacher, you have to practice as well. So you have to have real kids. You can't talk about it theoretically and actually have it. you got to actually do it. How many people here have ever been trained in CPR? Okay. How many people here have ever had to save a person's life? Great. If I vapor lock today, I want the two of you to take care of me, okay? <laughs> I don't want anybody in here, a textbook person, to touch me. I don't want to be laying on the floor gasping my last breath, turning blue, and somebody pulls out a little red cross book and says, okay, now what are we supposed to do here? I want action. Do you see what I mean? But unless you've done it, Unless you've experienced and you practice it, you're not going to be very good at it. And behavior is hard. Even the techniques I'm going to talk about, they're hard to do. And if you don't know what to expect and you can't know what the outcome is, you're going to more likely stop doing something before it's going to be successful. We need to make sure that teachers have the ability to apply what they've learned at the university level in the real life situation. Practice makes us better at what we do. Everyone here knows this to be true. You are a better professional than you were the first year you started working. Isn't that right? So the same thing applies when we talk about how we prepare our teachers. How children are identified for special education. When I started as a school psychologist, there was one disability category, and, and that was it. You were mentally retarded or you were not separated by an IQ score. Those were the terms that we used. Think about that. We now have 13 disability categories in counting. We hardly even know what normal is anymore. Think about this for just a minute. We have so many categories. Autism used to be symbiotic infantile psychosis. It is now pervasive developmental disorder. Everybody has it, except if you're a kid of color. Isn't that weird? 
Think about that for just a minute. I will tell you in every state I've ever been in, in every school district I've ever been in, there are more children who are autistic that are Caucasian than there are black children or kids of uh, Hispanic children. The fact of the matter is we need to recognize what that might mean for us. The disproportionality in the process and the identification has lost its effect. We shouldn't be interested in etiology. It makes no difference what we call it. What's important does the behavior that the child engage in fall out of the range of acceptability and what are we going to do about it? We're going to talk about that as we move forward. How we use research for informing instruction, I've already given you one of my biases. We talk about that, but frankly, you're not very good practitioners in the area of research. We know, for example, that much of the research that is written does not meet the gold standard. And we need to be sensitive about that. You need to be far more literate in terms of your understanding and research and when it's appropriate. Let me give you a concrete example. How many people here have heard of the LOVAS method of dealing with children with autism? Okay, all of us have. Done in a study in the late 60s, 70s on, on about 17 children. It has taken precedence in interventions for many, many children. But the reality simply is, is while discrete trial training is very effective, the basis of, for that training starts with, on 17 kids. That's a very, very small population. And those children were not r randomly selected in the same fashion that true studies are done. So my point is, I'm not against discrete trial training. I'm just saying to you, let's call it what it is and make sure that we understand that certain interventions don't work with all kids. You need to individualize what you do for children based on their needs, not based on some theoretical process that somebody believes it has to be this way or that way. We need to make sure that we inform our, our, our practitioners based on knowledge and information that is relevant and appropriate for their classroom. And finally, if I may be so bold, how to build positive, productive social relationships. This is about us, is it not? How many times have you been in a meeting problem solving on a child and then you left the meeting and the problem is on your shoulders and not anybody else who was in that meeting? As a school psychologist, I used to go in think it was my job to solve the problem and when I left the kid was my problem and I had no ability to change the kid because I didn't teach the kid in the classroom. Do you know what I mean? I lost the perspective here and now I go in and I tell people here's what I think you could do and if they say no I can't do that then I shake their hand and say thanks have a nice day and as I'm walking out the door they said I thought you were going to help me and I said well I offered you help but you weren't interested in it. If you want me to help I'll come back and we'll talk about what you can do to be a to, to work with this child. Not what I'm going to do to deal with this child because it won't help you if I do it right. If I go in here and make this boy or girl do what you want them to do, tell me how that helps you. Do you see what I mean? I want to give you the skills. I want to build your capacity. That's going to be the important part of this process. So we have to talk openly and freely, but we don't do that very well. Why? Because what happens in our work is we create an evaluative and judgment model. If the three of us were in a problem-solving meeting and you said, you know, I've been teaching for 10 years and, and uh, I can't handle this kid. The rest of us would go back and, hmm, teaching 10 years and doesn't know how to do his job. We make valuations and judgments when in fact we should, say, should be saying, what skills do you need? What can we do to help you become a better teacher to work with that particular child? How many people have seen the pyramid for the RTI model? I believe it should be put someplace where the sun don't shine, personally, okay? <laughs> That's my view, because it's all wrong. It's all wrong because it points to one place. It points to the top that says, finally, when the kid gets to the top, regardless of how you look at it, somebody else should be responsible for that kid. Isn't that true? Everybody says it's about the steps that we go through. But at the top, even though it's not about special education, it is about special education because in the end, if you go through tier one, you go through tier two and tier three, and you're at the very po end of the point, who are we going to call in, right? Here's my view. Turn that pyramid upside down. I want you to look at the ceiling for a minute, if you would. Imagine if all the kids in your school came through that ceiling and the base that every teacher in your school had the ability to deal with every kid who came through there. And as the kid, kids funneled through that upside down pyramid, the services changed by frequency, intensity, and duration, and group size, but the people didn't. That everybody had the same skills. What changed is that instead of me saying, you take this kid out of your classroom and give them to you, the better model would be, what skills do you need to deal with this child? And how do I change the context so it's more likely you're going to be successful? If I say to you as a teacher, 
you keep dealing with these kids. You've got 30 kids in your classroom, plus you deal with this target kid. We're not going to be very successful. But if I say, I can free you up for a period of time so that you can, in fact, work with this child in a smaller group situation more intensely and more specifically, you're more likely to be successful. My point is this. You can't just have certain people do certain things. We need to build capacity. It's about skill building, is it not? All the teachers should have the skill set to deal with the child. What should change is the context. That's my view. We'll talk about how that happens. Think about this. I'm a very good flyer. How many people here are, are uh, fly in, uh, frequently? Anybody? Great. I'm very good at it, but most of you are what I call skill deficit flyers, okay? You're not very good at it. And my personal feeling is this. The later I get to the airport prior to September 11th, the more excited that made me feel, okay? My office is at least 30 minutes from the airport. If I'm leaving at 3 o'clock, I might leave my office by 2.15, okay? I like the possibility, or did, that when you get in the plane, they shut the door on your little seater and bam, you go, hoo -ah! That's a great day. You know what I'm talking about? But then September 11th came along and all of a sudden now we have all these security lines and people get in line and they have all these rules. Isn't that right? I know the rules. I'm good at understanding the rules. I know about my boarding pass. I know about taking my shoes off if I need to, if, not, if I'm not TSA pre-check. I know all that stuff. And you don't. And I would be getting to the, to the plane, the airport late, and I would be backed up because people like you didn't know what they were supposed to do. You can read. You've read the newspapers. You know what the rules are. You're not supposed to have things. And it used to irritate me when people would be shoveling things, they're taking their shoes off at the last minute or looking in their purse and changing things out. And, and I would get mad. And then I realized, Eric, Eric, you train people to think these things through. This is a teachable moment. This is an opportunity to build capacity in other people to be better flyers. So now I go say, do you have your boarding pass ready and available for inspection? <laughs> you, are you sure you don't have any liquids in the shampoo there? <laughs> How about those shoes? Time to take those shoes off. I love to see your ID. I bet it's a great picture. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> My point is this. I've gone from consequent driven to recognizing that in the context of flying, <coughs> your skill set is different. Either A, you haven't practiced it, or B, you're anxious. And when you're anxious, it affects the way you think about things. Do you see? So as we move forward and shape confidence and competence, we need to recognize that it's our job to make that process happen. What's the problem? Turn to you in the middle of page five. Interventions typically used by teachers to deal with challenging behaviors have three characteristics. They're unsystematic, they're negative, or they're a combination of those two. That's the way we think it works. Why is that? Well, first of all, because we haven't taken the time to collect data to see if what we're doing works. And secondly, most kids are intrinsically driven. Bless you. If I may just digress for just a minute, by the way, it just usually doesn't happen until later on in the, in the session. But I'm such a dynamic speaker that the dust rises from the floor <laughs> and it makes people sneeze. So thank you for doing that. And it's in the back row. So that's particularly reinforcing. So feel free to sneeze at any point in time during this day. Thank you for doing that. That was very kind of you. Okay, good deal. Now, so let's talk back about this. Why, why, when you think about it, we haven't collected data, but why do teachers use negative consequences for kids? Because it works for intrinsically driven children, which is about 95% of our population. We're fooled into thinking that when you reprimand a child who's not, who doesn't have a skill set, you think it's going to work because most of the time it works for other children. We need to recognize that's not the model that works for our target kids. We have to change that process. We have to be a bit more systematic, and I'm going to share with you how that works. Turns out the research about classroom performance suggests a deeper philosophical issue about your belief in the nature of behavior and your ability to address the behavior who exhibit challenging behaviors. Turns out that people who use punishment do so because it's particularly reinforcing to them. Think about that for a minute. How many building principles are there in this room again today? Can you raise your hand? Tell me if this is not true. If you have a behavior problem child in your school and you remove them for a day, at least for a day you have a nice day. Okay, that's called negative reinforcement. The problem is they keep coming back. Isn't that true? I was working with a principal a few years ago and they had a very tough kid and he had suspended this young boy from school. And he calls me up and he had just a panic. 
And I said, what's the matter? He said, well, the kid's out on the playground. He said, should I call the police? And I said, what do you mean he's on the playground? I said, he's not at home where he's supposed to be. He's on the playground. He's not supposed to be here at school. And I said, well, let's do this. Don't call the police. Why don't you go get the kid, bring him in and ask him what he wants and let's give it to him. You see, the difference is, is that the fact of the matter is, is that these kids don't have the skill set necessary. Sending them home to a place where they're not going to learn what we want them to do is not going to work. Who at home is going to teach them how to do what you want them to do in the school environment? We're the best place. You see, we're their last chance option. Think about this for a minute. If truly target kids didn't want to be in school, how come they always show up? How come they always come? We, you know what? We should be doing attendance studies and the pandemic bird flu virus and Ebola and find out these kids have emiological issues because we could be running all over and they're the only kids that come to school. You have to say to yourself, what is it we have that they want? But then what happens to them as we move up through the trend? And by the time they get to middle school, they don't want anything to do with us. What is it? What happens there? What changes that dynamic? My point is, is this. Schools are intensely rule-governed, culturally determined settings that require specific behaviors to be successful. And I'm saying to you, when you see problems in your school, these kids don't have those skills. Period. Nobody's taught them that. Nobody's reinforced them that, and what they've done is they've learned a skill set on their own in order to manage their environment. I'm not saying it's acceptable or right, I'm just telling you what the truth is. And we need to say, okay, let's make the parallel to academics. If a kid comes and he learns the wrong way to phonetically analyze a word, we don't punish him, to do, do we? We say, no, let's correct that. Isn't that true? The same thing should apply for behavior and discipline. I want you to think from now on that every time you see a discipline issue in your school, think skill deficit, first and foremost. Even though you've seen a kid behave in one environment and you think it'll generalize, it does not. And I just proved it to you. I just proved it to you about the skill building issue for flying. My point here is this. Think about this. All kids who engage in inappropriate behaviors do so because they don't know what to do properly. Nobody's taught them. And keep in mind, it's our job to do that. And I'm going to share with you why that's a hard and a difficult thing to do. It's about recognizing that schools are intensely rule-governed environments. And it may be something these kids have not learned. So, let's talk about changing behaviors. There's three opportunities to change inappropriate behavior, and it's quite clear. Number one is all about prevention. Before the behavior occurs, a proactive teaching strategy. Did you know, for example, that 82% of non-compliance follows a command statement? 82% of non-compliance follows a command statement. What does that mean? It means that what we ought to do is change the way we issue the command statement. It doesn't mean that we should punish children for not complying. It means change the way you ask children to do what you want them to do to increase the likelihood that they will comply. And I will teach you an intervention called the Precision Command Format that I've developed that has a three-base pr prong process that talks about just doing that. The reality simply is I can change the outcome of a compliance statement simply by changing the way I ask you to do what I want you to do. Think about that. Old model, kid misbehaves and I punish them because they're not compliant. New model, I think of a new way to ask them to do what I want them to do so they're more likely to do it. Doesn't that make sense? It's about me, not about them. Decreasing anonymity is a powerful tool. Let me give you a concrete example. Most target children know who their foils are in the school. Most of them know there are certain teachers that they need to be responsible to. But imagine this, suppose I'm floating down the hall one day and your name is? Brian. Brian, and Brian is a teacher and Brian says to me, I'm in the hall and I'm not supposed to be there. And Brian says, hey you, what are you doing in the hall? He's just told me he has no idea who I am so I can do just what I like because I'm not going to have any after effect to this. On the other hand, if Brian sees me in the hall and says, Eric Hartwig, nice to see you. How have you been? All of a sudden, it tells me a different story, does it not? When I was a young man, when I played in the band, when we get done playing, we would go to the local restaurants when we get back into town. And we were pretty cool, we thought, and I remember this. I'll never forget this experience. Um, 
we're sitting against this car waiting for the girls to come up to us and the boys to tell us how exciting and great we were and all that other crap you think about when you're a little kid. And this guy comes up to me, this gentleman, he looks at me, he says, say, uh, is that your car? I said, no, it's not. And he said, should you be leaning on it? And I said, well, I don't know if that's really a problem. He said, I don't think you should. And by the way, Eric, when I talk to your dad tomorrow, I'll let him know that you're hanging out here at nighttime with some of these people that maybe he might not approve of. And I realized all of a sudden it was the sheriff from the county and he knew my father. My father was the county highway commissioner and he had seen me in pictures, or apparently knew me. I had no idea who he was, but I will tell you this. When he first told me to get off the car, I'm thinking, who are you? But when he said, Eric Harwig, and I'll talk to your dad tomorrow, it had a very different, <laughs> very different effect. Isn't that not true? So the point is, is that when you decrease anonymity, that's a preventive model. Do you see, if I'm walking down the hall and I'm thinking I'm free because I'm not in that class, but you come up and Brian says to me, Eric Hartwig, all of a sudden I'm thinking, uh-oh, uh what else does he know about me? Do you see? It changes the dynamic of my behavior. So, first of all, it's about prevention. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the interventions that we talk about in terms of prevention or management or, in fact, uh, a consequence. But prevention, I want you to think about what can you do in your environment to prevent a problem from occurring. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples of that as we go through the day. Number two, managing it during the occurrence of the behavior. And this is a management intervention. When a kid tells you to put your head where the sun don't shine, that's not a time to say to them, well, how do you think that makes me feel? <laughs> it's not a manageable moment, okay? It's not going to do you any good to try to mediate that in a negative, confrontive way. Why? Because every behavior has a biological component associated with it. Fight or flight. We know for a fact that everybody here has a fight or flight mechanism built automatically into their body. Management is about trying to make it calm. When you see a kid who's dysregulated, you shouldn't become dysregulated, but it happens all the time, does it not? One of my favorite pastimes is to go to the grocery store, not to shop, by the way, because it makes me anxious. Um, when you go to a grocery store and you're supposed to pick something up and your wife will say, you've got to go to this shelf and there it'll be, and you go there and they've changed it, that's an anxiety producing situation for me, so I, I prefer not to go to the store. But what I like to do is take a little portable chair and I like to sit at the checkout counter. And what I do is I wait for my victims. And it's usually a family with young children, okay? And here's how it usually f works out. You're sitting there quietly and you'll see a basket full of groceries, just stuffed, okay? And you'll see a young parent, mom and a dad, and, or it could be even older parents, it doesn't matter. But you'll see a little kid, about two years, maybe two and a half years old, can walk, can talk a little bit, wants their own way, okay? What's at the checkout counter? What do kids want? What don't parents want kids to have? Bingo, okay, we got a problem, do we not? So I'm sitting there and I'm just waiting for the problem to escalate because this is where it's fun. Because I know it's going to happen. Because here's how it goes. You're sitting there and the little boy or girl sees a candy bar and they say, and they usually take it off the shelf because it's right there. And the mom says, oh, you, or the dad says, you can't have that. And the kid will go, I want that candy bar. And then the mom said, no, you can't have it. We're going to go home and eat dinner. Like that's going to really make sense to this kid, okay? <laughs> And the kid will then will go, I want that candy bar. And this is where I intervene because I hate whiny little kids, okay? <laughs> so I go up to the kid and say, listen, if you're going to throw a tantrum, add some physicality to it, okay? I want to see some head banging. I want to see some spitting. I'm not even opposed to biting. But this, I want some candy is too low level. We got to do something more exciting. So here's a quarter. Go practice how to do a better tantrum. And then I give my card to the parent and I say, perhaps you ought to give me a call. <laughs> my point is here is this. How many times have you seen a kid turn an adult into a raving lunatic? <laughs> it happens all the time, doesn't it? And the reason it happens is because we have fight or flight built into our bodies. And what we have to do is manage that. We have to cognitively change our thinking and our behavioral patterns to mediate it. Isn't it right? Is it true? that everybody in this room feels anger. Isn't that true? How you manifest your anger is different, and we'll talk more about that later on. My point simply is, is that biology is the seed, but it's not how the kids actually act in the end. Well, how children act in an inappropriate way is because they've learned to do so. Aggression and violence, people like to think that somebody just snaps. Turns out that's just not true at all. For most kids, 
It's a behavior that's been learned. Why? Because it's richly and reliably reinforced in our environment to be physically aggressive. The reality is we should be saying to ourselves, why does the kid have to engage in that level of inappropriate behavior to get what it is they want? What lessons have they learned? Most kids start from the same place. The question we say to ourselves, what has life taught them? And we need to be able to break that cycle and change it. And the sooner we do it, the more likely we're going to be successful. But part of that is managing ourselves. How do you manage it when a kid says something terrible and ho horrible to you? How do you manage it when a kid is disrupting your classroom? How do you remain cool, knowing full well that biology affects you? Practice. It's that simple. Practice. How many people here have been trained in CPI? Okay. How many people use it on a daily basis? Okay. You guys are good at it, but most people are not good at it, okay? When they train you and they talk about this thing, and when the kid comes at you with a knife, what you need to do is turn him around like this, go like this, drop him down, and then life will be good. If you've ever done a two-basket hold or any of that kind of thing, that physical, commo it's ugly, is it not? It's not that pretty, and the fact of the matter is most of us don't do it very often, so the point simply is you don't get very good at it. I'm not suggesting you should be good at it because you, obviously when you have to physically restrain a child, you've got a bigger problem that you should be talking about. But my point is when you do it, you want to do it right. Isn't that true? But it's about practice. It's about managing and being calm. But it's hard to be calm, isn't it? Think about this. Remember, every behavior has a biological component associated with it. How you act on that biology is learned. So what we want to do is teach teachers to be able to regulate themselves so they can regulate a dysregulated child. Kids who are exposed to traumatic experiences in their life, the cortisol continues to push through their system to the point that they are always ready for fight or flight. And we need to be able to calm them down. We need to set the environment in such a way so when a kid says to you, put that put your head where the sun don't shine, we should be saying, hmm, I wonder how I could do that. At my age, that would be physically impossible <laughs> to do. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm moving away from the target. I'm starting to meander and everybody's wondering, what is he thinking about? But meanwhile, what I'm do doing is trying to calm myself down. How many people here have ever had an argument with somebody they care about? How many people here have felt that the threshold was getting to the point where you're going to say and act in ways that were not appropriate? And you decide to time yourself out, okay? And you walk away from the argument. Just say, I, I got I to cool down here just a little bit. You walk away and you say, and by the way, one more thing. You see all of a sudden you explode like a marshmallow out of a blast furnace, okay? The reality simply is we need to manage ourselves even in difficult and unmanageable situations. We need to be calm. Not a, a, a negative. We need to be assertive and we need to be calm and we need to regulate children who are not regulated themselves. Managing it during the occurrence of the behavior is a critical part. We'll talk more about that later. And then finally afterwards, the bottom line is the consequence can be delivered at any point in time. And the last time you want to deliver them for kids who are highly engaged, you don't want to be able to say, if you keep doing that, you're going to get detention for three years or whatever it might be, because you're going to make an emotional situation even more traumatic. Consequences can follow after the inappropriate behavior. They, they can be delayed. We need to be able to recognize the implication for consequences and recognize that consequences are about paying the price, about making it right. But there has to be a fix-it component that we'll talk about more a little bit later. So three times to manage behavior. 80% or greater of your emphasis should be on, bless you, prevention. Number two, it's about managing ourselves, recognizing that we want to regulate the environment and ourselves in such a way that when the child engages in inappropriate behavior, we're going to be able to mediate it. And number three, what are the consequences? What are you going to do to make it right? Consequences can be long-term. Let me give you a concrete example. This is a hypothetical story. Let's suppose, um, uh, my, my, this is not hypothetical. My friends and I have season tickets to the Green Bay Packers. If anybody watched that game yesterday, that was just a hot game, was it not? It was really, really good. Who do you guys watch here in Indiana? Who? The Colts. Who? <laughs> yeah, boy, I wonder how Peyton Manning is doing. Anyhow, oh, I know, it's a tough one. I just had to throw that in there a little bit, okay? Anyhow, but Andrew Luck seems to be doing pretty well, too. Did they win yesterday? They played Thursday night. They played Thursday night. Oh, 
They did. Okay, good deal. I don't pay attention to the Colts, but the Packers, as you know, are America's <laughs> team. Anyhow, I have season tickets to the Green Bay Packers with some buddies. Now, we think that when you have a game at noon and you go to Green Bay, it's about an hour and a half away from my house, so you got to get the, ready for a game. You know what I'm saying? So we leave maybe 7 in the morning, you know, 7.30 at the latest, so we get to the field so we can get ready. You know what I'm saying? And let's suppose that the team does very well. They win, okay, and it's 3 o'clock when it's over, and you decide you've got other things that you want to do because you're pumped, so you keep going. And let's suppose that you don't get home at till 2 o'clock in the morning. Again, purely hypothetical, okay? <laughs> and that you were supposed to be home at 5 because your mother-in-law is there for dinner, okay? <laughs> and that when you get home, because you didn't anticipate, again, this is just purely, purely hypothetical, that you didn't have your key because you didn't expect to come home so late and you had to ring the doorbell and your mother-in-law is the one that answered the phone, I mean the door. Let me ask you, do you suppose that when you got there and this situation happened and, and your wife approaches you and you say, gee, I'm sorry, and she, do you think she'll say to you, well, I hope you had a good time and I'm glad you're home safe and sound. Do you think that's the way it always pans out? It's not like that, is it? The situation can be explosive. The point that I'm suggesting to you is that consequences can be delayed. Consequences don't have to be immediate because your wife in this hypothetical situation could be very pleasant at that moment but you know, you know that something's going to be coming down. You're going to pay dearly for this indiscretion that you had no idea or control over. You know what I'm saying? The point simply is, is that consequences don't have to be immediate. And unfortunately what happens, we have thought to ourselves that they do. And as a result of it, we've taken a very simple situation and blown it up because we deliver the consequences when the kid's not ready to hear it. You see where I'm going? Good. All right. Now, so... There are some core values and things, and I'm going to touch on those, but I, we have to have in order for us to be able to move through the day. And what are those? Number one, prevention, as I've made it very clear, is the first response to challenge behavior and crisis situation. From now on, everything we talk about is going to be preventive. What can you do to prevent the problem occurring? When you saw me in the hall, Brian, the problem was not about the hall behavior. It was about how come I'm in the hall? How come I'm not back in my class? What's going on in the class? That's where the problem is. It's not in the hall. You just don't want to make it any worse. It's about prevention. So we got to think backwards. What's the chain that caused that inappropriate behavior in the hallway? Number two, discipline like uh, 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 instruction is an opportunity to learn new skills and, re and replacement behaviors. Our goal here is not to stop inappropriate behavior. It is to teach the behaviors we want children to engage in. That means when you see a child who's engaging in inappropriate behaviors, they don't have the skill set to do what you want them to do. So our job is to be able to figure out what they need. And I will tell you, this is probably going to be the hardest discussion we're going to have all day because if I go into a problem-solving meeting, I can ask anybody what the kid did that's wrong and they will give me a litany. It'll be boom, 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 boom. But if I say to teachers, okay, all right, what do you want him to do? Or what do you want her to do? They'll say, well, I just want them to behave. Well, I say, what does behave look like? They have no idea what to do. So we have to give them some ideas of what we should be doing and expecting what the outcome is going to be. We need to be able to make sure they understand that part of the process. Number three, we're going to encourage a sense of community responsibility and problem solving, and that's far more important than compliance and obedience. We want kids to make good decisions when you're not around. Isn't that right? How come we, when we drive, down the highway, how can we drive five to seven miles an hour over the speed limit and no more? We know that that's the right thing to do. We know that that's the close to possibly beginning stop, but it's still safe. Isn't that right? We've managed ourselves in a way to recognize that stopping at a stop sign is good practice. It's a safe thing to do. Isn't that right? We don't want kids to think that the only time you have to behave is when I'm around. Do you see? We want them to think on their own. Make good decisions when you're not there. Not just because the policeman is watching them, not because the fact that the stop sign is there and someone's got a camera watching you. It is about what? It is about making sure that we're making good decisions. When I was in New York in the, in the newspaper on the Brooklyn Bridge, they added another uh, camera that catches people doing things they're not supposed to do and they were telling that they increased the tickets. Uh, for one month it was like 23,000 tickets or something like that they gave for people that were not doing things they were supposed to be doing. And people were mad at it and saying they were being caught. And the question really is, well, no, 
you weren't doing the right thing. The fact that the camera was there and to had to stop you, and so people are defensive in what they should be saying, hmm, maybe I shouldn't be breaking the law. Do you see? Maybe I should be doing the right thing and stopping at this light, or maybe I should gradually transition into this lane. My point simply is we want community and responsibility and problem-solving thinking. We don't want kids just to say the only reason I'm being good is because I know I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. That's a very wrong thing. And if you're compliance and obedient driven, then all you're going to use is punishment. And it's always going to be linear. You don't do something right the first time, I'm going to punish you the same way the second time. Number four, strategies and behavior intervention plans do not fill basic relationship, uh, human needs only relationships do. As we go through the day, we're going to talk more and more about how relationship building is going to be essential. It's about how we do this that's going to make the difference in kids' success. It's a two-edged sword, though. The closer we get to a child, the more likely they're going to disappoint us. Isn't that true? Everybody here in this room knows this to be true, that as kids do things, they disappoint us. What we have to do is not personalize that. We need to recognize it's our job to make them into problem-solving adults. It's our responsibility to recognize they're going to make mistakes, going to make, do things that are going to hurt our feelings. We have to be bigger than that. We have to be able to change the perspective that we have about ourselves. It's about relationship building. So we want to get close to that kid, but we got to recognize that they may hurt us at some point in time as well. But we need to jump back on, and I'll give you some ideas about that as we move through the day. Number five, nothing about this is going to be easy. There are no quick fixes, and I will tell you that when I develop an intervention program for a child and the teacher tells me in a day or two that they're perfect and it really, it's like magic, I'm very wary. Because I know the kid is playing with the teacher at that point in time, okay, until they can get their way. How many times have you had parents say to their own children, I'm laying down the law, and they lay it down for two or three days and stop doing it. Isn't that right? And pretty soon the kid continues to do what they want. We need to build the infrastructure and the capacity for our staff to, be, to realize the responsibility is greater than just control. It's about making sure that we look for the long-term benefit. That aim line is going to be reciprocal. We want it to move up in the right way, but it's not always going to be in the manner or the fashion that we want. It's going to be gradual, it's going to be incremental, and that's healthy because we're replacing old behaviors with new behaviors. And finally, measurement. There is no problem that you have in your school that you can't take two or three days to establish baseline. You got to do some data collection. You got to know really is it a problem. I can't tell you how many times as a psychologist I went into a classroom focusing on a target kid and noticing that there are other children in that class that do that inappropriate behavior far more frequently than the target kid that I'm talking about. And I got to ask myself, how come this kid is on the burner and these children are not? Or if this is the standard of comparability, why isn't it acceptable for everybody else? We need to recognize the idea is that Behavior falls into a range of acceptability, and would you agree this is true? Everybody has a different frustration tolerance, right? You can go into a classroom and the kids are perfectly calm, things look perfectly organized, and a kid could drop a pencil on the floor and the teacher could get very angry. And you could be in another class where the kids are all over climbing the walls and doing stuff and the teacher looks around and says, wow, what a great day we're having here. The kids are exploring, you know what I mean? It's a very different dynamic. But measurement is your friend. There isn't anything else in life that we don't take the time to collect data first. If you want to save money, you know it. If you got none, you're starting someplace, okay? That's your baseline. If you want to lose weight, you're certainly going to weigh yourself and then you're going to figure out how, what your goal is going to be. Well, the same thing comes with behavior. What about the frequency, the duration, the intensity, the locus of the behavior? Why wouldn't we want to identify that to see if it truly falls out of the range of acceptability. Now, George Bush told us by 2014, which we are in 2014, that we would be 100% competent in the public schools, and I'm saying government would be 100% competent by 2014 too. Never going to happen, is it not? The fact of the matter is the bell-shaped curve is alive and well. I want you to look around the room for just a minute, the people in this room at, at, that you're sitting next to. Some of you know each other, I know from your school. But wouldn't you agree there are a lot of odd people here today? <laughs> I don't mean that in a disrespectful way at all, okay? 68% of us fall one standard deviation above or below the mean. We're worried about the tails, are we not? Do you know people who are unhappy all the time? They're on this tail. We don't like that, do we? 
But you know people who are happy all the time? There's something wrong with them too. <laughs> That's just not happy, healthy. Happiness is designed to fade. And you can't be happy unless you've been sad. Do you see what I mean? My point simply is, is that our goal, if you think about the bell-shaped curve, and I want you to draw one right now, right on your plate. I want you to think about this. I want you to put a line down the middle. That's the mean. 68% of us, one standard deviation above or below the mean. That's what we want to do. We want to tuck put kids so that they fall within the range of acceptability. We're not trying to create robots. We want children to behave in a way that's acceptable, on a range of acceptability. Isn't that true? Tell me if this is not true. When you're in a school environment, there are certain expectations that people have for you. When you get out of that environment, the expectations change, do they not? Turns out, interestingly enough, when you look at some of the research, children with behavioral and emotional problems oftentimes do better outside of the school environment than they do in school because of the encompassing fact that the range of acceptability is greater. Would you agree that behavior in New York would be different, the expectation for appropriate behavior might be different in New York than it might be in Fort Wayne? Of course it is. There is a range of comparability. I'm not saying that there isn't a normal or expectation. I'm saying for the most part, there are certain things here we expect that they may not expect in New York in terms of behavior. Uh, uh, my daughter was telling a story about uh, something she was in, trying to get, get some groceries and she had a, a, my grandson and you know she was, couldn't get them all packaged up and, and she, she kept looking to the person behind her and finally said to the checkout guy, said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about this. I, I don't want to make people mad here and I feel bad about it. And the guy said, hey, these people are from New York. They're always mad. You're not going to do anything worse to them already. Do you see what I mean? So the point that I'm suggesting to you is this. We want to be able to measure does this kid fall out of the range of acceptability? And if not, then what do we have going on here between that teacher and that child? What, what's different? And let's be frank about this. There are some people and some kids that just don't get along. Wouldn't you agree with that? Okay. There are some of us that aren't going to get along. The fact of the matter is that we have to recognize that and that make, changes our data. Measurement and data tells the tale. We want to be sure that's the way we look at it. So what are we going to focus on? Well, take a look at this. Um, this is my upside down pyramid and there you have it. Shove it up against the ceiling in your school and start to think about this. What changes between the top, the middle, and the bottom? The only thing that changes is the way we change the groups, the intensity, the frequency, and the duration. We shouldn't be changing the staff. All staff should have the same capacity to deal with all children. In public, if, if you were to die in a hospital today in Fort Wayne, uh, there is in fact uh, a process that they go through, it's called morbidity or mortality conference. And the doctors and the nurses and they get together and they decide what went wrong here. Not to find somebody to blame, but to figure out what went wrong so that the next time they have somebody in there that the same thing doesn't happen. We need to have a similar conference in, 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 in schools. We have to have the ability to be able to say, if you don't have the skill set necessary, let's not blame you for not doing the right thing. Let's figure out what skills you need so that you don't have that problem in the future. Do you see what I mean? But tell me if this is not true. Do we not have tiers of expectations for our staff as well? That we have certain teachers that we say will only deal with certain kids and that special education is about only dealing with the toughest kids? I, I'd like to postulate a different model. Why don't we give all of our teachers the same skill set so they can deal with all the children so that when we talk about integration, when we talk about cross-programming, when we talk about uh, integration opportunities for all kids, that the teachers have the skills necessary to perform successfully. Think about this. I call this the sphere of influence. I want you to draw a circle, okay? And I want you to put a dot in the middle of that circle. Okay, now that's the target kid. I can tell you this. I can take a kid and put him inside of a circle and I can control all the variables in that circle and I can make that kid look very good. Isn't that true? I can create all the right environments so that tile will be successful. The minute that dot moves outside of the circle, if I haven't expanded the skill set necessary for that child and the people they're going to encounter, the kid will not do very well. Isn't that right? How many times have you seen children do very well in a self-contained or a cross-categorical model and then you put them into a regular ed environment and they don't do so well? Okay, what's missing? Does the kid have the skills to move into that environment? And does the environment have the skills to address that particular child's needs? That's where we fail. 
we take a kid and we put them in an environment where they don't have the skill set necessary, or the staff are not trained to deal with them. And I'm suggesting to you this, that alterable environmental, environment, uh, and environmental events are about teaching our staff the skill set necessary for them to mediate the things that children do. I'm not saying all skill sets, I'm saying the majority. There's a skills that we're gonna talk about that are pervasive that all teachers should know and can apply. You don't have to be a specialist to be able to implement a precision command statement. If you issued a precision command statement for kids who don't need it, you're gonna increase your compliance even more dramatically. If you issue it for kids who are non-compliant, it's more likely you're gonna be successful with those children than not. So why would I say that I'm only gonna teach you how to do this and say to you, ah, you don't need that. You're gonna have the kid, but eventually then I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna integrate him into your classroom, but I haven't given you any skill set. And the teacher is saying, wait a minute here. How am I gonna deal with this kid? You haven't really given me the skills to deal with that child. Do you see what I mean? We need to recognize that it's not just skill deficits in children, it's skill deficits in our, our staff as well. We wanna create the health. Now, one of the things, if you turn to the top of page eight, is the idea is that the health of the school is about recognizing the majority of the children in your system do what you want them to do. Isn't that true? And let me ask you, how many people here have taken the time to collect data on that? When you report information to your state department, do you tell them how many kids attend school on a regular basis or do you tell them how many kids are truant? Which one do you report? You do. How about school suspension? Do you report how many kids don't get suspended from school? No, you, you do how many are, are, are suspended, isn't that right? In Wisconsin, and I don't know if you have this, we have a law about seclusion and restraint. Once a year we have to report how many times kids have been, you do the same thing? Yeah. You report it. Do you report how many kids are not restrained or secluded? Who do you report? How many are. Hmm. <laughs> so what does that tell the community about how healthy your school is? It doesn't tell them anything, does it? Think about this, and when this first, last year was the first year we had to report, what's the first thing the newspaper was reporting? How many kids were suspended or, or physically restrained in the school? And all of a sudden, a little problem looked like this. Tell me if this is not true. I'm certainly concerned about the effect that Ebola could have, but the reality simply is, is we're talking about one or two people out of what? How many millions of people are in the United States? Certainly, we want to be sensitive to it, but 99.999% of the people in the United States don't have Ebola. Do you see what I'm saying? But we take the negative, magnify it, and we don't ever talk about the health. You know, when I was a young man, you heard the news once a day, maybe. Okay? Now you can see it repeated 10 times. You start to think that when they repeat it, it must be worse than it actually is. Isn't that true? When it turns out it's the same story over and over again. It changes your perception. So when we talk about discipline and behavior, what I want you to be thinking about when you collect data, don't you wanna know the health? You should be reporting to your school board what percentage of children are not restrained or secluded. What percentage of children attend school on a regular basis? What percentage of children in your classroom do the right thing? And you're gonna have some very nice numbers, isn't that right? About 85, bless you, percent of your children are doing what you want them to do. We don't ever talk about them. Well, the point is, in order to change behavior, you gotta enhance the health of the community in the school to be able to deal with the outliers. If you don't focus on the health, you don't change the kids who are target behaviors. That's a very important part of our process. Discipline now is about what? Sending a message that we have rules here. And when you play by the rules, you get punished. And if you, play, if you play by the rules, if you don't play by the rules, you get punished. And if you play by the rules, you get ignored. How many people here think they're a positive person? Raise your hand. You're a little hesitant to do that, aren't you? Because you know I'm going to tell you that you're not. Okay? And you know why you're not? Because we're nice to people when they do something we want them to do. When do teachers acknowledge positive pro-social behaviors? When kids do what they're asked to do. Do you know that nine out of 10 comments that a classroom teacher will make to a child will be negative? Nine out of 10. Don't believe me? Go ahead and track it. Go sit in any classroom in, in Fort Wayne or wherever you're located, wherever your schools are, go sit in there and you count how many times non-contingent positive reinforcement is delivered to children. 
When kids behave, we ignore them. When kids misbehave, we attend to them. We got to turn that around. The health defines the appropriate behavior. If I say to you, I like the way you're paying attention today, I appreciate that. I've sent a message to you and to everybody else in here what I like. Isn't that right? But if I say to you, can you please be quiet? Will you cut that out? What message have I told everybody else in this room? I've told everybody else, be alert because she's going to pick me out. Instead of saying, what is it I want to be doing? Maybe I don't even know what's <coughs> acceptable to be doing. All I know is what you don't want me to do. Do you see the difference? Discipline is not about sending a message. It's about teaching children the skills we want them to behave in systematically. <coughs> Bottom of page eight, behavioral synthesis. So let's establish a common thread of understanding here. This is going to be about attitude and perspective, understanding behavior. Um, again, as I said before, I fly quite frequently. Um, how many people here ever fly through Chicago O'Hare Airport? Here's a little practice in tr don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, was coming back from uh, two weeks ago, I got caught in the middle of that firestorm thing and I was delayed and my plane was canceled. Where was I? In Little Rock, Arkansas. And I was doing a presentation and I got a text at 10 in the morning that said this fire was going on in Chicago and that you weren't going to get to back home. And then, they, then I took a lunch break and then they told me that what they've done is they were going to fly me the next day, not the day I was supposed to be home, to LaGuardia and then from LaGuardia to Chicago and then from Chicago to La Crosse and then it was kind of like I could see the words maybe written in there as well, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, I will tell you, you do, if you can avoid Chicago, please, please do so for your own well-being. Now that being said, I was in Chicago and I got delayed and I was very frustrated but I decided, you know what, again, got to be cool about this. So I, instead of standing in line with everybody else, I started wandering around the airport looking for a sky cap to see if I could get a rebook through a sky cap because sometimes that's a quicker way to do it. So I'm wandering around, nosing around, going to the bowels of Chicago O'Hare and I finally find one and I'm standing in the line kind of minding my own business and there's a man in front of the line, one of those people you encounter once in a lifetime. He was very mad, I mean really mad and he was shouting at the sky cap and the louder he became, the calmer the sky cap was. It was, it was, it was astounding. The guy said, and you cancel me again and he used all these words and the guy said I'm sorry sir I apologize for that and the guy said something else and he said I'm sorry sir I apologize for that too he said in fact I apologize for everything that's been wrong in your life <laughs> I, mean, I mean he just de-escalated this guy to perfection guy moves on it's finally my turn and I say to him I gotta tell you first of all I want to apologize for that man previously. I, I, I want to tell you, I apologize for his behavior. I, I, and, and you were astounding. I just want to tell you how much I recognize what a nice job you've done. And the man looks something like I'm kind of a nut. And he said, well, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And I said, by the way, and he's still doing my bacon. I said, I, I train people. And, and I, uh, we, we have training programs in school to help de-escalate behavior. You know, man training system, CPI, CPR, things like that. CPI. And I said, does United Airlines have something like that, a training program? He said, no. And I said, well, how do you maintain such a positive attitude? He said, frankly, he said, I get paid to do this job. And every time somebody comes here, it's showtime. Showtime. Okay. And I thought, wow. So he's finishing up and, I'm, and I turned back to him and said, I don't mean to be persistent. He said, but you are. And I said, yes. <laughs> I said, but I train people all the time. And I said, I'm just wondering if you have something that you could share with me, how you manage that man's behavior so well. And he said, uh, he said, you would share it? I said, yeah, I would. I'd like to use it. He said, then I can't tell you. And I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, because I might get in trouble. And I said, well, how about if I said, I'm a psychologist. And when I do training, these people, this is, I have privileged communication. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I said, these people would be my clients. And, I, and, he, and I said, so how do you maintain such a positive attitude? And he said, well, sir, he said, that man is on his way to Tokyo, and I've sent his bag to Cleveland. Okay? <laughs> Tell me if this is not true. The sign of maturity is the ability to delay gratification. Isn't that right? The guy gets to Tokyo, and he has no bags. Who does he have to blame but anybody else? But tell me if this is not true. When we talk about positive reinforcement, isn't it hard to be nice to somebody that's been difficult for us if Carol here is somebody in my class and she's been a problem for me and she and I've had this escalating confrontation 
if I go to a training and I say, Carol, you need to be nice to Karen. Karen. You need to be nice to Karen. She says, I can't. And I'll say, why? Because you know what Karen said to me yesterday? You know how, do you see how this sort of configures? My point simply is, is that imagine that baggage man, that, that the individual, the, how many negative confrontations he has, how he can manage it and make people's days, regardless of the process. My point simply is, bless you, we need to figure out how to make people positive non-contingently. Most of us always do something before we're acknowledged, sometimes not at all. What we need to do is turn that around. We need to be able to have teachers have recognized non-contingently positive, acceptable behavior in children randomly and give it to people that might not expect it. I was uh, in, uh, again, I said in New York, and I was, my daughter had asked me to get something for the birthday party, and I was in a, 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 a drugstore not too far from her apartment in Battery Park. And uh, I'm standing in line, and there's this woman who's in front of me. She's got a cart. She's got a little brand-new baby, must be six months old, okay? And she's got a little boy, maybe two years old, and he's very curious looking at everything. She's got her diapers. She's got her milk. She's got all this stuff, and she starts to... She, you know, she puts it up and the lady rings it up and she has, finds out she has no wallet and no money. And you could tell she was very flustered. And, and she, she told the lady, she said, and you could tell her baby was starting to get you know, you could, anxious and stuff. It was very uncomfortable. And what happened is the, 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 the woman said to the, the checkout person, she said, I'm going to have to take this stuff back. And I said, wait a minute. I said, here, let me pay for that. And she said, oh, no, I can't have you do this. I said, no. I said, let me pay for that. So I paid for it. Not to get acknowledgement, but the fact was it made me feel so good because in the end, the woman was so incredibly appreciative, but not even that. The checkout counter lady who was very frustrated at first about the woman not having the money looks at me and said, sir, you certainly made a, a, did a good deed today. And she said, you made me feel good too. She said, I need to think about myself a little bit more specifically in the future. Again, not the words she used, but you could tell she was moved by the event. My point was, is that did more for me than it did for the woman. She said, can I pay you back? I said, no. I said, I just, it makes me feel good. Thank you for making my day. Do you see? When you give acknowledgement to somebody that doesn't deserve it, it's, it the, the giver gets more acknowledgement for it than the receiver. Think about that. We need to turn that dynamic around.